Okay. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, we're well behind schedule, so uh, do you have some spitballs to throw at me when I go too long? <laughs> Is this microphone working? Can I be heard? Okay, good. All right. Uh, all right. So Carlos has explained that I'm really a particle physicist, a theoretical physicist of the standard stripe, but about 10 years ago, for a variety of reasons, I got very interested in trying to think about how a theoretical scientist could uh, do something useful for biology. Bi biology obviously was undergoing a transition uh, from a science that had, uh, how shall I put it, limited data to a science that had more data than it could possibly eat, and something had to be done about this. So anyway, that, that's kind of the background for what I will try, I will be talking about today. I was going to say a word or two about why I'm a particle theorist is talking about biology, but I think that's already been covered, so I'll pass on. So let me begin by talking about theoretical physics. So I call this talk a biological agenda for theoretical physics, so I'll spend a few minutes uh, reviewing what theoretical physics is and maybe tell you some things about it that uh, you may not know. So for starters, uh, theoretical physics is hugely ambitious. Uh, theoretical physicists are frequently accused of being hugely arrogant. Uh, <laughs> and, well, part of the reason for that, I suppose, is that if you think about it, what theoretical physics claims to do and has in many, and it has, has managed to do in large measure in the last few centuries is to provide a quantitative uh, mathematical framework for understanding, uh, well, pretty damn near everything about the physical universe. I mean, even uh, in the last uh, 50 years or so, we have pretty much nailed down, uh, at least in a descriptive fashion, how the universe began, how it emerged from an, an initial inchoate, extremely high density, high temperature state, how um, the stars and galaxies formed, and eventually um, we think we know enough to describe the behavior of matter in essentially every place that it exists within the uh, current universe. Okay, I was, I was a little bit worried about this. Okay, am, am I too loud or too... Yes, okay, so if I stand back like this, it's okay? Better, closer, okay. All right, this is the, uh, I don't know, I, I may engage in an oscillation feedback loop like uh, was being described this morning, the little tinker toy cars coming to the intersection. Okay, but as we're all aware, even though we know, ev we know a lot about, and virtually, I'll explain what I mean, but uh, we know enough to describe pretty much all of the states of inanimate matter from the beginning of the universe to this very day, there are a few things that really are not fully captured in the net of theoretical physics or physics in general today. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. All right. So let me uh, cover, let me say a few words about what I think most people who go into theoretical physics regard as the primary task of theoretical physics, why, why, they're, why they are there. Well, it's to discover the fundamental mathematically expressed laws of nature and the stuff that obeys those laws. Uh, and I threw in, in our universe, because as we've learned things more and more about the laws of physics and the stuff that obeys them, the more and more clear it has become, I think, to most that, well, this is a, um, how shall I put it, this is a contingent thing. That is to say, it could have been different in another universe. We're not exactly clear why alpha is 1 over 137 in this universe, but it's not a number that we expect to explain from first principles. So, but we have a pretty big universe, and it's really quite exciting to know all the things that we do about this universe. Uh, these laws are valid within broad domains of phenomena and are in some sense pretty simple. Uh, some of them kind of fit handily on a postcard if you write them in shorthand form. And I think everybody knows, roughly speaking, what the steps were as we discovered these laws over the centuries. And we started with Newton in, this, in the, uh, eighth, in the um, 17th century. Uh, Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism in the 1860s, and as a follow-on special relativity a few decades later, Einstein's general relativity, gravity as dynamical geometry in the 19-teens, quantum mechanics in the 20s, quantum field theory in the standard model of 
everything down to the shortest distances that we're able to probe, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. And today, I would say one of our great theoretical achievements is uh, a cosmology and a theory of the universe, of the origin of our universe that actually works in considerable detail. So uh, the, common, the outcome at the moment of the uh, following the uh, basic rules of theoretical physics, namely looking for the fundamental laws, uh, is a pretty impressive structure. So it's a precise mathematical theory, and the scope is pretty much everything. So this is what I think most, of, most kids who grew up to be theoretical physicists kind of dream of. There are these beautiful equations that uh, incorporate all of these things that I was just mentioning. Uh, there's Einstein's, laws, Einstein's law of uh, gravitation, and on the left-hand side, you have geometry, whoops, and on the right-hand side, you have um, the sources of energy and momentum. For quantum mechanics, you have Schrodinger's equation. And if you go, you got to go past undergraduate physics to get there, but there's a similarly lovely set of equations which describe the strong force, the things that hold, the, the, the equations that hold the, the quarks together in neutrons and protons and eventually make the, the matter that we see in uh, chemistry and nuclear physics and the like. Okay, but uh, what I would like to pursue is a, is a somewhat different thought. Namely, there's another agenda for theoretical physics. Discovering the fundamental laws is the historic core mission, uh, but that's not all theoretical physicists do. In addition, we would like to explain phenomena that are not directly baked into the fundamental laws. And uh, this is something that maybe not everybody is intuitively aware of, but uh, you typically, frequently when you write down these, these uh, beautiful equations, they are equations that govern the behavior of things that you've already directly seen. And it tells you how they work together. And the broad outlines of what you get out uh, typically don't surprise you. You sort of knew it was going to happen. On the other hand, we're well aware that there are phenomena that we believe, we're quite certain, are actually predicted by the fundamental equations, but they're not directly visible. A, an effort of the imagination or some uh, rather impressive achieve achievement in mathematical analysis is necessary to see that this unexpected or un, um, well, unexpected phenomenon actually is a consequence of the equation. Let's call them emergent phenomena. So, uh, a major example of that would be, let's say, superconductivity. Superconductivity is a macroscopic quantum effect. It is implicit in Schrodinger's equation when you put together uh, atoms and uh, make metals and then do the appropriate uh, study of quantum mechanics at low temperatures. One should be able to explain superconductivity. It's an observed phenomenon. It's definitely not a phenomenon that you put in, you, that you put in by hand uh, into the Schrodinger equation. Or, uh, somewhat more close to uh, current uh, issues, prove confinement. Namely that when I put the beautiful equations for quantum chromodynamics on the screen a couple of slides back, they were equations that govern the behavior of quarks and nobody's ever seen a quark. You put three quarks together to make a neutron or a proton, and remarkably, uh, we believe that you will never be able to extract an isolated quark from a proton and observe it directly and measure, let's say, its charge directly, because its charge actually is uh, third fractions of uh, the electron charge. And so there is a phenomenon called confinement, namely, these elementary constituents are there, they're observable dynamically, but you can never isolate them. Prove that, that's an emergent phenomenon. Uh, better yet, we would really like to predict unknown emergent phenomena, uh, derive them from fundamental law before their experimental discovery. Our record on that is pretty poor, but it does happen occasionally. Now, life, I would say, is the emperor of all emergent phenomena to slightly deform the title of a recent book that I found rather interesting. Um, it, it is certainly, we believe, fully implicit, directly derivable from the fundamental laws of physics, mostly classical physics, by the by, but we have no idea how to do it. And I, I would say 
one of the things that crosses the minds of many in the physics community these days is maybe it's time whoops, to uh, bring living matter, phenomena of life, into the realm of predictive mathematical science. Now, looking for beautiful equations like these postcards from uh, fundamental physics is probably not the way to go about this. And on the other hand, modern physics in fact uses a methodology that we don't talk about in public all that much, although there's nothing disreputable about it, that probably is more applicable to biology than trying to write down the Einstein equation or the Schrodinger equation of life. So let me uh, spend a few minutes riffing on what we actually do in contemporary physics. So um, in cosmology and particle physics, we actually do not directly measure that which is of most interest to us. We would really like to know about certain things that are in some sense hidden variables. We don't always know what those hidden variables are, but we certainly need some kind of theoretical framework in order to learn about these hidden variables, these hidden entities, uh, from what we actually can observe. Now, I'll give you a concrete example of that in a, in a bit. So, the way we actually proceed is that we use our beautiful equations to construct a model with parameters for how hidden things generate the actual data, data sets that we can measure. And then we use something called statistical inference. And this is actually a subject which was addressed by Professor Hopcroft yesterday uh, to essentially see through the noise and, discovering, and discover the underlying physical entities and the parameters that describe them. So this is a universal method in modern physical science. And my point is that biology will need it too. Uh, vast amounts of data are being collected in biological science these days. And I think uh, it's nothing controversial to say that when the data sets are large enough directly, they don't really mean much. They really need some kind of mathematical framework to hang them on, use them to make predictions and gain deeper understanding. At any rate, this is how discoveries have been made recently in cosmology. We've basically learned how the universe came into being, that is to say, from some simple initial state, the complex universe of galaxies and, and uh, black holes and who knows what all else uh, arose. And it's also how things work in particle physics. If you've ever looked at what is actually observed at the Large Hadron Collider, what you see is a mess of tracks in some kind of detector chamber and with a massive, massive effort of analysis and interpretation, this turns into nice clean plots where you see, uh, you know, number of events as a function of some mass in some channel. You see a, you see a nice blip that's a five sigma, uh, five sigma event above noise and you say, aha! That is the Higgs boson, and its, and its mass is 125.4 GeV. Okay, so I, I want to follow that track uh, some distance. So let's go to a very specific instance of it. And this is the question of, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about how we do cosmologies, cosmology these days, how we know the age of the universe, and a bunch of other things about the universe we live in. Okay, so this is a somewhat busy slide, and I'll try to walk you through it and make a rather general point, which I won't be able to elaborate on very deeply, but I think the, the broad outlines, I hope, will come across. So, the most um, informative dis measurement in cosmology uh, in the last 50 years has been the observation of what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Basically, you point a microwave antenna, uh, basically sensitive to uh, electromagnetic waves in the 100 to 200 gigahertz range, sort of fractions of a few millimeters in wavelength. And you, if you were to turn it into an audio output, you would hear a hiss. Psss. And that hiss is easily interpreted as the universe is not at absolute zero. The universe, away from all stars, galaxies, and other hot things, is actually a little bit warm. Not very warm, only about 2.7, whoops, I have a problem with this thing. 
Uh, it's about 2.7 degrees Kelvin on average. Okay, this is nice to know. But the people who have followed this experimental track over the last 50 years have gradually improved their ability to measure the actual temperature in, all, in various directions in the sky to the point where they can actually measure it with an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. It's really quite remarkable. So here is a map of the temperature of the sky, somewhat massaged, I have to say, but still, it's a reasonably direct uh, representation. And the, the false colors, the blues, the greens, the yellows, and the reds, are not the temperature, but they're the difference in the temperature from the average, more or less in units of 10 to the minus 5 degrees Kelvin. And you, you have lots and lots of little dots because you can point your antenna in different directions in the sky. And this simply represents the sky in some coordinates that are uh, nailed to our galaxy. Now, there's a certain limit on the number of data points you can get because you're looking at a certain microwave frequency and you're, you have only a certain angular accuracy that's available. And so there are roughly, I don't know, a few million independent data points that can be obtained. So you measure the temperature of the sky uh, in little patches that are a fraction of a degree across, and you measure that temperature to an accuracy of one point in 10 to the 5, and you plot the delta T, as it were. That's it. That's what you, that's the data. By itself, it really doesn't say a heck of a lot. Now, everybody in science, when they're faced with things that you measure that vary from position to position, whoops, I have to stand next to the microphone, okay, <laughs> what they will do is ask, well, uh, how, what, what is, what's the nature of the spatial correlations in these measurements? In other words, if it's hot here, how far away do I have to go before it's cold? And is there some distance from here uh, where if I go, it's correlated again and it's, it's, it's hot? So this is what's plotted here. This is the uh, power spectrum, as they call it, of these fluctuations on the sky as a function of the angular distance between point A and point B. And if it were completely flat, you would say, well, this is just white noise. Nothing is going on. But it isn't. It has a big peak at roughly two degrees, and then it has another, another rebound peak and another rebound peak after that. And you will notice, A, there are dots. Those are, the, those are the experimental values emerging from doing this measurement. And they actually have error bars on them. They're just so small you can't see them. So this is, there's enough data so that the uh, error bars are invisible. And there's a red line, which I won't go into in great depth. But the red line is the, what you predict from an underlying model. Now, what do we mean by the underlying model? I'm not going to be able to go very, very deeply into this, but roughly speaking, what governs how this stuff happens. By the by, we're looking at what the universe, we're in effect looking at the universe at age roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. You can, um, at the time of the Big Bang, uh, well, at any time, the universe actually has multiple sources of energy and gravitational attraction and whatnot in it. There's the matter we know, the, the protons that make up the hydrogen atoms, that make up the stars, that make up the galaxies, and so on. That's called atoms, let's say. There's something that you've no doubt heard about called dark matter. And dark matter is, well, it could be dust, it could be any number of things, but it's just, it doesn't interact to speak of with the matter that we know, the, the hydrogen atoms and the nuclei and so on, and it kind of behaves like dust. It has a different dynamical behavior than ordinary atoms. There's light, there's photons, there's neutrinos, the things that uh, were talked about in the very first uh, lecture in this uh, meeting. And by putting together a proposal, well, there's 63% dark matter at the time this snapshot was taken, and 12% ordinary matter, and 15% photons, and so on, you can working your way forward in time from zero, when the temperature is infinite and the universe is infinitely compressed together. I should say we use Einstein's equations to do that. We follow it back. 
um, you can predict what this red curve should look like. And if you change the numbers here, the red curve would go in a different set of peaks and bumps, and you wouldn't see what you actually see. So from the data, lots and lots of it, doing some sort of standard data analysis to convince yourself that something interesting is going on here, and then building a model out of the fundamental elements of things evolving in a cosmological space-time governed by Einstein and different kinds of energy, you can figure out, well, how much of the different kinds of energy is present. And the fact that there is dark matter in such abundance is a very, very important and, um, well, it is a very important fact to have discovered. It's also, this picture looks different if I say now instead of 13.7 billion years ago because as the universe expands, the photons get cooler, the ordinary matter gets more spread out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there would be a different picture. In any event, there is an underlying mathematical framework that behaves according to certain laws. You don't know how many of the different elements that you could put in, you should put in, but you figure it out by essentially uh, statistically inferring from this data set what set of inputs would actually reproduce it. Okay, so this is something that we do in a whole bunch of different um, areas in modern physics. Now, I would say that modern biology has a similar method problem, if you want to call it that. Um, the data is just too copious and indirect to mean anything without a mathematical framework. And this is true in many areas. So uh, I won't, you know, well, there's sequencing. The sequencing re revolution has made it possible to get DNA and RNA sequence from, you know, individual organisms, populations of organisms, um, and, and we'll go into this, some of this in greater detail. Uh, you can now, if you want to study how the brain works or how sensory organs work, instead of looking at what one neuron is doing, you can actually look at hundreds, probably now thousands of neurons as they are doing whatever the living animal is doing. And you can start asking yourself questions about, uh, well, how do they do that? How does it work? Um, we can do all kinds of things that exploit modern computer science to, to gather data. One thing that I'm kind of amused by is what I would call automated, automated quantitative behavior tracking. You can watch a fly doing things that flies do. Now, if you do genetic mo modification of a fly, you will cause, cause it to do strange things. It might walk with a limp or something like that, or it might be uninterested in female flies, or it might never wash its uh, antenna, or so on. And in the past, you had to say, well, I will, I will have a little jar full of these flies, and I will watch them, and I will take notes, and I will say what their behavior is, and I can correlate what I think the behavior is with what uh, I have done to their genome. Nowadays, of course, you can do image analysis. You can take movies of the fly moving. You can turn the movie into an actual uh, quantitative uh, accounting of, after all, the fly has got only a finite number of moving parts. The different bits of the legs are at different angles to one another. And you can, in effect, map what the fly is doing at any instant onto some point in some high dimensional space that tells you what are the angles of the different bits and pieces that it can move. And then you can, then you can do good old computer science of the kind John Hopcroft was talking about to say, well, uh, at this time it's moving in some cloud around a point in this high dimensional behavior space, and now all of a sudden it does something different. It's in some other point. You can start doing uh, automated, um, how shall I put it, identification of different modes of behavior, and you discover that animals, they can't do just anything. There are well-defined, finite sets of uh, different types of behavior, and th this is going to be something that will play a big role in our understanding of nervous systems and signaling systems. Okay. Well, I, I think there's no point in going too deeply into this. Everybody knows that you can, in biology, collect large amounts of data in sequence. You can collect large amounts of data in uh, looking at the patterns of firing of neurons. One of the more amusing things is that there is a, an experimental animal that is, whose, um, how shall I put it, 
very well developed from the point of view of genetic manipulation called C. elegans. It's just a little millimeter-sized worm, and it has a finite number of neurons in its body, like order 700 or so, and it's so small and so transparent that with optogenetic techniques, you can actually observe what every single neuron in this animal is doing as it is doing what it does. So, and, and that's what this little uh, picture is showing. This is, you know, neurons 1 through 141. That's not 700. This is just all the neurons in this, what passes for a brain uh, of this uh, worm. And you see ups and downs along as you go across horizontally. That's the level of calcium activity in the neuron. Okay, uh, so I, I think I don't need to make the point any, in any greater detail that there's a lot of data out there. In the, okay, uh, in the past, theoretical physicists have been attracted by the problems of life and have uh, thought about certain specific issues and uh, have um, made some important contributions. I, I just remember the famous book by Erwin Schrodinger in the early 1940s, What is Life? In it, he, ana he analyzed the question of, well, where, is, where could the genetic information be stored, given what we know about quantum mechanics of molecules, given what we know about the rate at which x-rays cause mutations, that is to say, changes in the stored genetic information to happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he concluded that basically uh, genetic information had to be stored in a polymer of some kind, probably a big one because there's obviously a lot of information there. And um, then in the 1970s, John Hopfield and Jack Nino independently addressed the issue of, from the point of view of fundamental statistical mechanics, what can one say about how uh, genetic information is uh, how shall I put it, preserved in the copying that has to take place as a child organism is created from a parent and the DNA is copied. If you just looked at the difference in the binding energy between the, the four bases, uh, it's only, it is, it's non-zero of course, but you know, when a new base is incorporated as the DNA is being copied, it's really energetics that determines whether an A goes here or a C or a G and sometimes by thermodynamics, an error will be made. And the error rate, if you just had straightforward thermodynamics involved, uh, would be much too big. So they, they said there must be another mechanism, essentially a proofreading mechanism, and they worked out the details of how that could work. And indeed, we haven't, have found ultimately there is such a mechanism. Okay, so what I'd like to turn to, now that I've, am I halfway through? Roughly halfway through. Okay, so I'd like to turn to um, what theoretical physicists who are intrigued by this problem uh, can do these days when they face up not to the broadest possible interpretation of the problem, what is life, but rather say, okay, given the material that biology is giving me to work with, what, what can I do that's of a, a particular value? All right, so theoretical physicists, once they get hooked on biology, uh, are naturally inclined to study issues that, if possible, are generalizable across the, the different kingdoms of life and suitable for mathematical analysis and can be illuminated by modern biological big data. So my plan initially here was to look at two examples that exemplify the theoretical physics method of understanding complex phenomena through inference of something simpler that underlies it and um, I may actually compress to one, since that might, I think that might very well make the point I want to make adequately. But let me, let me say, I have two themes that I would like to uh, put before you, and I'll go in detail probably only into one of them. Okay, so theme one is that at all levels, uh, information is being transmitted, stored, and manipulated by living beings. And, you know, when, um, I don't know, well, well, we'll look at, a, at an example or two, perhaps. And basically, the information for, the, sorry, the data needed to begin to quantify how well information is transmitted as, it's, as it passes from, I don't know, um, concentration of nutrients in the medium surrounding a population of cells to state of expression of genes inside the cell 
I mean, bacteria, as a for instance, have to decide whether or not they're going to run one of a number of different possible metabolic protein uh, programs, and they make that decision on the basis of some signal that they receive from the outside, and this signal is noisy, and they have to make the right decision. So there's a question of information involved there, and this goes all the way up uh, the, the scale of life. The other thing that I find particularly fascinating is that in all over biology, there's the issue of somebody has to look at some event which is noisy and decide whether it is of one type or another. Is it a meal or something that's going to make you a meal, for example, on the basis of just a quick glance, all right? And, you know, whether it's a tiger or a little sheep, if you're somebody intermediate on the uh, food chain, you got to make that decision on the basis of a quick look and, you know, the tiger looks different depending on whether it's night or day, whether you're seeing it from above or from below, and yet our, how shall I put it, our neural systems are incredibly efficient at making this decision on the basis of, in effect, one look at something that is, in fact, highly variable and uh, stochastic. So how, how do we do that? You know, what is going on here? How do you learn correlated probability, how do you learn these probability distributions so that you can use them to make uh, decisions? And you typically have to learn them from pretty sparse data. Okay, so these are two, th these are examples of themes that I find quite interesting. They're, they're, they're couchable in language that a theoretical physicist can be excited by and think that he can do something with. And um, so the first one, which I will probably not go into into detail, I'll just tell you what it is, is it has to do with embryonic development in a fly. And basically, in a fly embryo, there, you know, there's a, an egg, and inside the egg at some stage in the development, there are thousands of nuclei, tens of thousands maybe, and eventually these nuclei inside the egg have got to start to differentiate. Some of them have got to decide I'm going to be an eye, some of them are going to decide I'm going to be a leg, Oop. And, and so on and so on. And the question is, how do they do that? Well, they do that by essentially reading the value of a certain signal. And these signals are called transcription factors, and when the transcription factor concentration at some nucleus is above some critical value, then some gene transcription program turns on, and if it's below that critical value, it doesn't. And the very first such decision that's made in the uh, fly egg is, am I in the front or am I in the back? And so, uh, and here you can see the mother has laid, whoops, the mother has laid down some signaling uh, transcription factor called bicoid, and the nuclei inside the, um, inside the um, embryo respond, and when, when you are just above a certain threshold, they turn on a new program, and when you're not, it doesn't get turned on, and there's a difference in state of expression of uh, half of the nuclei, roughly speaking. Those that are going to be head, those that, are go those that are going to be thorax, those that are going to be abdomen. And the interesting thing is that these guys, these nu individual nuclei, have to make this decision on the basis of a concentration of a transcription factor which is small and fluctuating, and the machinery that responds also has noise in it. And the real question is, is there enough information available to the nuclei to do this job? So you can follow inf information flow in uh, embryonic development, and you can even do something that theoretical physicists like to do. You can find an optimal fashion in which the uh, embryo can make its decisions, and you can compare with data and have uh, have a nice afternoon. So I'm not going to go into that into great detail because I think it would make me run too long. Let me go into a slightly more detail in, the, um, in an example of theme two, which is uh, learning, trying to understand, learn, grasp, manipulate, use uh, probability distributions that underlie some important aspect of biology. So this has to do with how the immune system works. And, okay, so I have to give you a quick uh, primer on the immune system, which is one of the most complicated 
systems functioning in higher animals, but you can drill down to something which is actually quite uh, concise and, and uh, clean and quite clever. So we have T cells and B cells. They play the role of hunting down foreign, uh, of hunting down pathogens that invade your body. Uh, the B cells basically go after stuff that is floating free, and the T cells basically go after stuff that is hiding out inside your cells. I won't be able to go into it much deeper than that. The point, however, the remarkable point, is that in, so T, cell, T cells and B cells are examples of cells that circulate in their blood. They're part of the, I forget what the name of the lineage is, but there are precursor cells. Some of them develop into red blood cells. Some of them develop into white blood cells. Some of them develop into T cells and B cells. Okay, the actual, and, and the way these the T and B cells work is that they have proteins expressed on their surface that have a specificity, that is to say, a, ability to recognize a shape or a particular uh, pattern of nucleic, of, of um, amino acids expressed on the surface of something. Uh, and basically, there is an enormous diversity of these proteins that are expressed on the surface. It's as if you were trying to defend yourself against an army that had an unknown array of weapons. And you could make a soldier that was capable of dealing with somebody that had a six inch long knife, and another soldier that was capable of dealing with somebody that had a large scythe or something like that. And you, you, you would make a, an army of many different soldiers capable of doing many different things in the hope that the army that came at you would be made up of things that could be dealt with by one of your soldiers. And if one of your soldiers actually is good for dealing with the army coming at you, it sees that, it multiplies, it creates lots and lots of copy soldiers which are then able to deal with the invasion. So the question is, how do you get many, many different uh, so to say, surface receptors. Well, surface receptors are proteins. Proteins come from DNA. They're coded for by DNA. And, well, you know, why doesn't the gene, you know, the genome, the germline genome has normally a code for every protein that can be expressed. Well, for these surface receptors for the immune cells, the germline actually doesn't work quite that way. It has a lot of modules that can be selected and brought together to make a gene that will then be expressed as a protein. And in bringing those modules together, uh, a few other, first of all, choosing the modules and bringing them together. So here's an example. This is meant to be the germline DNA with a number of different modules that can be brought together. These V guys can be chosen, one of them can be chosen one of the D guys can be chosen, one of the J guys can be chosen, and in rough first approximation, that's done randomly. And even when those things are brought together randomly, one does a few other random things. One chews away a little bit on the ends, and one inserts a little bit in between. If you take a rough census of how many different outcomes can you get, it's very, very large indeed. And it is this possibility that is exploited by the immune system. And roughly speaking, the, the enzymes that do this bringing together of bits to make something that's randomized uh, is, is exploiting enzymes that were originally uh, brought into play to repair DNA damage and DNA breaks. And they're, they're doing something different. So you have roughly 10 to the 7 unique randomly generated immune, immune cell types in your body. And the goal is to understand this diversity and quantify it if possible. All right, so how do we do this? Well, by harvesting T cells from the blood, extracting and amplifying the DNA that is, so to say, characteristic of this variable region where the diversity of the T cell receptors is, uh, is expressed, and then using modern sequencing techniques, you can get examples of not just one or two, but millions of different examples of the sequences that were produced when this rearrangement process of the genome took place. Uh, by the by, there's virtually no overlap between the sequence repertoires of different individuals, and the only thing that really matters in some sense of the way that you characterize 
the, the immune system diversity has got to be statistical. You really need to understand their statistics to learn anything useful. Okay, um, I, so the strategy that one can follow is something like this. There's only a finite number of moves that can be carried out on, there's an initial genome that you know completely because people have uh, sequenced the human genome. You know what are the bits that can be brought together. Uh, the, the diversity, the, so to say, the combinatorial diversity of bringing together these different choices of modules is large, but you know, order thousand, not order tens of millions. So that's not all there is to it. Uh, they're really a finite set of random choices. You randomly choose which module you're bringing together. You randomly choose how much you chew away on the ends of these guys. You randomly choose how much you insert between pairs of these guys. And you say the probability, well, how shall I put it, the outcome, what you actually get as a functioning sequence is the result of these specific choices. We assume that they're random in a certain sense, but they presumably have some structure to their randomness, and we don't know what that structure is. We don't know what's the relative probability of choosing different instances up here. We don't know, to start with, what's the probability that I'll insert one base, or two, or three, or 10, or 20. These are numbers that I don't know. So this is a little bit like, I don't know how much dark matter there is in the universe. I do know what the outcome is, sorry, I, I know that, whoops, I, I know lots and lots of samples of the outcome of making these individual choices, and I can figure out, I, I can then do an interesting process of uh, statistical inference in which I say, I don't know what these individual probabilities of choices are. On the other hand, I do know a large number of outcomes, and I can say, let me try to find, let's put it this way, for each um, sequence that can come out, given some set of numbers for these probabilities, that sequence has a certain probability of being generated in one shot. And I have a whole bunch of sequences that I know were produced, and I want to find the choices, I want to find the values for these underlying probability distributions that maximize the likelihood that the thing that I actually see is what I actually get. So there, there's an interesting procedure of, as it were, looking through the, looking at the noisy data and looking into it to find out what it's actually, uh, how it's actually being generated. We can do this. Um, on this slide, I just show you some of the outcomes. Uh, there, there's a probability of making insertions, which you can, you can see is, there's a certain number which is the most probable, it decays away exponentially. You can assign that that's, that works. Different people have exactly the same within the noise uh, distribution. You can ex assign to every single sequence that you see the probability that it was generated in a single shot. You can therefore do all kinds of interesting analyses in which you say, you know, um, if there if there happen to be two sequences in two different individuals, is that significant? Does it signify something, or is this just random choice or a random chance. And if it's random chance, there's a certain, there's a certain number of such uh, identical pairs that should show up. So you can, and, and, and indeed, to the extent that there are uh, overlapping sequences, then they should actually be things that they, sh they should both be likely to have been generated, not unlikely to have been generated. So you can play all that game. So the total possible diversity is enormous, something like 10 to the 13 sequences. The unique clones we observe come nowhere near sampling uh, that, the full sequence diversity. And we can get sharp results because we assume that sequence diversity has a simple hidden source. All right. Why did I tell you these particular stories? Well, each is a specific instance of a broader class of conceptually similar problems spanning the tree of life and which, for which big data is available. Uh, I would just mention on this theme of um, probability distributions on high dimensional data, you know, I, at some point we will be able to understand how the nervous system works. Think of this, when you're looking at something, what's going to your brain and is translated into a picture of people um, 
sitting in their seats after lunch and probably wishing that I would finish very quickly. But what's actually coming into their brain is spikes going down nerves. There's a bundle of a million nerves that's coming from your retina and going to the V1 area of your brain. And each one of them is going bang, 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 bang. So there's, and you know, they, they can fire roughly once every tenth of a second or something like that. And if you look at the same thing twice, you'll get a significantly different set of spikes coming down the neural system. And yet each time, if I look at Carlos, uh, it says Carlos. And uh, understanding how, I, how, how my brain can recognize that this particular pattern, even though it's never repeated identically, is Carlos, is really one of the great, I would say, it's a theoretical mystery. We have to understand this. Okay. Um, Theoretical physics of life, the future. Well, big theoretical questions are waiting in the wings. They're way beyond our grasp today, but not, I hope, forever. My favorite ones are something like this. What is it about non-equilibrium statistical mechanics that makes it possible for populations, well, of species, distinct, stably reproducing entities to arise? As theoretical physicists, I mean, this is a, it's a, it's hard to, how shall I put it, pose this problem uh, precisely, but it's clearly a problem that should be posed, and we have no idea where to begin in trying to answer it. Are there equations describing evolution of organisms with thousands of genes? Can they be solved? Can anything be said about their global behavior? Can we capture the dynamics of a cell? What kind of equations could possibly accurately describe its behavior, given that a cell has thousands of interacting parts? Uh, can we see tissue types as basins of attraction of a large dynamical system? Brains carry out tasks that have an abstract representation. Can dynamical network models capture the processing power of a human brain or eye? And how would you map you know, some network model that you might do, put together that seems to do roughly the right thing? How would you map it onto what the actual biological thing is doing? So these are some of the big questions that a future theoretical physics of biology will want to tackle. And today we're doing warm-up exercises to prepare ourselves for the big task that lies ahead. And we're kind of done. It seems blindingly obvious that biology will need some kind of general mathematical framework to organize the data flood that's coming. I personally am rather skeptical that generic data mining approaches will do the job. I think that finding underlying structures are really going to be quite essential. Um, we need to rise above specific models for each specific biological problem. I don't claim that physicists are uniquely equipped for this task, but they're naturally inclined to look for the, gener the generality that we really need. And the concrete examples I described are pretty pale um, imitation of the sort of analysis we will eventually need. They're just baby steps. Okay. The problem is a major intellectual challenge. It's just as hard as the fundamental physics challenges we've solved in the past. And accepting it will ensure the future vitality of theoretical physics and, I think, biology. So with that, I will release you. Well, we'll probably have time for one or two questions. and. Uh... It's wonderful that we had this talk after John Hopcroft's talk because uh, you can make the parallels there. And uh, anyone? I don't bite. Jacob Palis. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, some time ago, I made a conjecture concerning dynamical systems. <laughs> which says that on a, an unbounded environment, typically it has only a finite number of attractors. So we may, uh, this conjecture has been proven to be true in a number of cases, but still uh, in general open. So it may be useful in your framework the fact that mathematicians are looking for a finite number of attractors that mean models on a bounded environment, typically. Well, uh, yes. 
<laughs> I mean, there are a finite number of tissue types. Um, a cell is uh, something that has interacting parts, lots and lots of them. Clearly, some kind of dynamical system is involved. And I think the real challenge is to figure out, well, what version of what the mathematicians call dynamical system equations is appropriate for really describing a cell? I mean, that, I think, is something which has not usefully been addressed so far. And the great thing is that we can now collect lots and lots, how shall I put it, the, the information that we will need to confront conjectured solutions to this problem is in the process of becoming available. So we can, uh, we, we can descend from the realm of abstraction and do some things that are concrete. Uh, the advantage of what I'm telling you is that this conjecture is very general. Okay, well. It doesn't require a special type of dynamics. Uh, Yes and no. I mean, I think I'd better try that offline next, after the talk. One last question from Elena. Thank you so much for your lecture. And uh, besides this, the antibody business that you clearly showed us, can you also follow, supposedly, by a cell behavior? If you, because it changes with time a lot. So all this, can you also introduce the variable of type? Because that's also very important when you are analyzing. In biology, there is a huge difference. Well, yes, I mean, that's certainly, um, how shall I put it? There's, uh, over, I mean, there's something like, uh, I, I don't know if there's any kind of ergodic behavior of cells. <laughs> I mean, any, an individual cell that's nicely behaving as, I don't know, an epithelial cell uh, is going to have some variation with time and its level of expression of this, that, or the other protein. And I mean, I think the baby problem would be to essentially understand, see whether or not we can model and understand the actual time dependence of the state of a cell that's not doing anything exciting. It is in, you know, one state in the sense of the pathologist, let's say, but in the sense of the physicist, it's, it is exploring some kind of neighborhood with some kind of dynamics and attempt, learning how to actually turn that into a quantitative statement, I think, is that's a fine challenge. Okay, let's thank Kurt again, and I'll pass the uh, microphone to Luis.